Um, okay, I'm really, really happy to start our last session, uh, which deal with modern uh, issues. And our first two speaker, we have two speaker uh, who are going to split the, I think, the lecture between them, is uh, Julia, uh, which is a doctoral student in the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary History in, at Thailand University. His area of interest are phases, uh, phases of entry into the end, into and exit from religious life in co contemporary Israeli society. His MA um, still dealt with the Alaphic ruling for uh, repentment, repent, repent, in Rabbi Moshe uh, Sonbu writings. And his PhD thesis deal with the uh, Shuva movement in uh, religious Zionism. Uh, you know he is a book editor and author of Rak Mitaniel, Just Wondering Judaism at Your Own Face, published in Megid 2019, a guide for people who are interested in adopting, re adopting religious, religious life. And uh, Adam Pfizer is a professor in the Israel and Golda in the Department of Jewish History at the Contemporary Jury at Dryland University. Uh, and holds uh, the SR Hirsch Chair for Research on the Torah with the Eretz Movement. He is a co convener of the annual, annual Oxford Summer Institute on Modern and Contemporary Judaism. Um, this past semester, uh, he was blinder visiting, uh, blinder, uh, visiting a scholar at Rutgers University. Is Paula? Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, Pfizer's research focuses uh, on the history of religious uh, responses to modern contemporary life in Western Europe, North America, and Israel. He's the author of, uh, of or editor of seven books, including Exclusion, Exclusion and Hierarchy, Orthodox uh, Non Observance, and the Emergence of Modern Jewish Identity. Jewish Dimensions and Beyond uh, Sectarianism, which was the winner of the National Jewish Book Award. So after this long uh, introduction, we'll jump in. And... So thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I just returned from Rutgers, and that's why I wasn't able to be at all the sessions, but enjoyed everyone. I want to thank Michal, Katel, and Yael for this wonderful uh, conference, the best kind, the workshop kind, where there's real discussion. Hopefully, there'll be that opportunity. Um, I'm very proud to be um, joining with uh, my dear friend and doctoral student, uh, Dori Ahav, in this presentation. I want to uh, just make two points before uh, Dror uh, presents, and then I will uh, step in at a certain point. Um, one is that um, Dror wrote an amazing master's thesis on Rabbi Moshe Sturmbach, um, and um, uh, now he is a doctoral student, and he recently received the uh, Milgat Nasi, the presidential uh, doctoral scholarship, as a recognition of his abilities and potential, and uh, this is his first opportunity to give a talk to um, advanced academics, not uh, other doctoral students. And uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. Um, and um, yeah, that I think it, um, says it. And now I'll hand it over to um, to Gerard, please. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, this uh, session is partly dialogue with the previous session because we, also, we'll speak about uh, two liminal characters. Um, but um, unlike the previous session, uh, our, the, the person that we're, I'm going to speak about lives, still lives a few kilometers from here. So it's not something from the 13th uh, century in uh, Egypt, which <coughs> is very, very uh, contemporary. So uh, Rabbi Moshe Sternbuch was born in London in 1929 and grew up in a strictly Orthodox Jewish family. He moved to Israel as a young adult, where he integrated into the religious culture of the elite non-Zionist yeshiva. Today, he is a rabbi and vice chief religious court judge of the Edah Haredit, the veteran community in Jerusalem known for its serious religious norms and anonymity toward Zionism. He is renowned 
adjudicator with seven volumes of response on a wide range of issues reflect his prophetic intellectual range. Thus, they offer a fascinating lens through which to explore contemporary issues as articulated through the voice of a major ultra-Orthodox authority. One of the topics to which he dedicates considerable attention, attention is the status of the newly observant Jew, the Baal Tshuva. Contrary to the dominant trend of living religion <clears throat> that has increasingly characterized Jewish life since the 18th century, the Chilun, a reverse global movement of religious renaissance began in the 1960s. No doubt it was smaller than the massive seculariz secularization trend, yet it was sweeping enough to draw considerable media and academic attention. People who until then had defined themselves as secular Jews and were not observant of Jewish law began to lead religious lifestyles and, so and sought to join Orthodox society. Most of the newly observant allied with the Haredi world, which they perceived as religiously authentic. Leaving their place of origin was a complex endeavor, but no less difficult was the process of their absorption into a conservative and homogeneous society that had unequivocal norms and codes of conduct unfamiliar to the new entrants. Rabbi Steinbuch's engagement with the Baal Tshuva phenomenon, uh, which is very unique to, the, uh, to the, uh, uh, such a character uh, in the Haredi world, was fostered during the tenure in the 1980s as rabbi of a community in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was oriented toward attracting less affiliated local Jews to heightened religious engagement. Notably, in light of his position within the ultra-Orthodox landscape and reputation for stringent, stringent interpretation, his legal approach to the newly observant is quite flexible and illustrates his desire to ease the way into full compliance and socialization. Academic literature, okay, I will now speak about the conversion and then I speak about the Baal Tshuva. We will see uh, the things that are uh, compliant, things that are a bit different. Academic literature has introduced conversion as an appropriate paradigm for describing the process and reception that repentant individuals experience. Mm -hmm. Thus, a comparison between two forms of Jewish religious identity transformation and acquisition, formal gear, and adoption by a secular Jew of an observant lifestyle offers a valuable tool for highlighting commonalities along with exploring distinctions. Sternbuch's legal writings offer a rich case study. He addresses uh, a broad spectrum of questions relating to official conversion, often noting direct parallels with the newly observant experience. In other instances, he did not specify the connection in writing, but the similarities of the circumstances encourage a comparative perspective. In the following, we will present a number of examples in which Steinbuch introduces comparison between the two, or they come across through similarities in the circumstances. Based on his lenient approach to halachic issues related to the newly orthodox, one might expect that he would demonstrate greater legal flexibility regarding formal converts as well. This, however, is not the case. By pointing out commonalities, Sternbuch did not intend to extrapolate from the newly orthodox to the convert. Rather, the opposite. He utilized existing halachic constructs regarding the convert as a vehicle for articulating a core understanding of the transformational character of the modern Baal Tshuva, novel figure in contemporary Jewish life with no clear precedent. President. Once this common element was established, however, we made great efforts to clarify the critical differences between them. Stalmuk's position regarding you is not unto itself really surprising. For it dovetails with the overall conversion policy of the Izadah Haredit faction and stands in opposition to the more fluid approaches that have emerged from the religious Zionist sector. That said, examining uh, Sternbuch's rulings in conversation with the, his more flexible judgments relating to the newly observant facilities, a more profound understanding of his core approach to contemporary Jewish identity. This heightens attention to a fundamental divide between Haredi Orthodox and religious Zionist perceptions of conversion. The conversion paradigm and the modern penitent. Sensibly, Sternbuch's linking of converts and repentant Jews can be traced to earlier biblical sources. 
The Mishnah in the first chapter of Tractate Baba Metzia discusses the prohibition. Uh, there are source sheets uh, yeah, in the middle of the table. I will say uh, uh, soon. I will read them. Uh, in Baba Metzia discusses the prohibition of onaat varim, fraudulent speech, and offers the following example. If one is a penitent, another may not say to him, remember your earlier deeds. If one is the child of converts, another may not say to him, remember the deeds of your ancestors, as it, it is stated, and the convert shall you neither mistreat, not shall you oppress him. Correspondingly, Shtermo declares that this is a, in the sources number three, the punishment for one, I read in English, but the, it appears in Hebrew, the punishment for one who harms a newly orthodox Jew is great, like one who harms a convert. Thus, one must be vigilant regarding the repentance, honor, and not embrace them. Building on the biblical reference, it presents the convert as a paradigm for an individual who deserves special, special consideration. This differs from the rabbinic reference that specifies the child rather than the convert themselves. Synthesizing the two sources together, moreover, facilitates Sternbuch's novel ruling that the principle derived from the convert should be applied equally toward the repentant born Jew as well. By equating the oppression, the convert and the penitent, Sternbuch illustrates in legal terms the reality of the contemporary world. The pre-modern rabbinical literature, for the most part, the term Baal Tshuva did not describe a person who had previously been fully detached from the observant community. Portrayed rather a Jew who was part of the mainstream Jewish community but had been lax in the religious in his religious behavior, or possibly detached from for a brief period, had not sought to make amends. Medieval discussions now, now sought to make amends. Now sought to make amends. Medieval discussions of the Baal Tshuva, such as the seventh chapter of Maimonides, Ilhot Tshuva, are indicative of this understanding. The late 20th century penitent, by contrast, was someone who had not led a normative religious lifestyle at all, and later chose to completely transform themselves. For this reason, the association with the convert, rather than the child of the convert, was a more accurate correlation. Further example of this level of correspondence between the convert and the contemporary newly orthodox Jew is reflected in the language used by Sternbuch to describe the metamorphosis experienced by each character. Uh, in uh, source number four, regarding the former, he declares, the enlightened convert is very close to God because he moved away from his family and sought out, no, sorry, it's, not, it's one, sorry, it's source number one. The enlightened convert is very close to God because he moved away from his family and sought out the Shekhinah. He should not be rejected for his lineage is that of the descendant of Abraham, the father of many nations. From, his, from this perspective, indicates Shembuch, the Baal Tshuva has much in common. In source two, for he left, the Baal Tshuva, for he left his house and the house of ancestors like Abraham, our father, in his time. That said, he adds a positive comment regarding the newly orthodox that he does not share in respect to the convent. On the contrary, penitent is superior to those who grew up in a religious home. This nuanced distinction suggests, once again, that inasmuch as Sternbuch draws benefit from the comparison, he also finds ways to place the newly orthodox on a higher pedestal. In this case, it both the convert and the individual who was educated from childhood to be religiously observant. I will now speak about the distinctions between the Ger and the Baal Tshuva. So far, we have seen examples in which Talmud focus on similarities between converts and repentance. Now we will move to sources that emphasize the differences. The first relates to the desired pace of progress into religious life. Since both the secular Jew and the Gentile have little or no familiarity with uh, Torah study, observance of Jewish law, or the principles of faith, the transition from the world to an orthodox milieu is very, very sharp. Thus, one would expect that Sternbuch would set similar guidelines for the process of adopting a full-fledged orthodox lifestyle. This, however, again, is not the case. Regarding the Val Tshuva, Rabbi Sternbuch instructs that the process of entering the orthodox world should be carried out gradually and over time. 
encourages small measured steps appropriate to the level at which they are, they are at a given moment. Turning to those who guide repented Jews, he exhorts, this is uh, source number four, begin with about Tshuva as with a small child who first lies down, then sits, then stands, then crawls, and then walks and runs and, and the like. Thus, you accustom the Baal Tshuva only to what he is capable of receiving. And you burden him only with what he can sustain until he gets used to it. For those who put more burden on him and demand from him at once full observance of the entire Torah will cause damage, as the repentant will be frightened and afraid of the difficulty and may even abandon the process completely. The legal upshot of this instruction is that regarding those in the process of becoming observant, rabbis must rule leniently in such a way that will facilitate their gradual progress. Converts do need time to learn all the laws, but as opposed to the repentant com compatriots, according to Sternburg, they must declare their full commitment to Jewish belief and practice from the outset. Otherwise, there is no justification for enabling their process. Ironically, this would appear to contradict the position of the Talmud itself, which offers a vision for the convert that is very much like that which Talmud is reserved for the repentant Jew. The convert, according to the Talmud, should not be taught all the laws at once, but should be informed of some difficult commandments and some easy ones. The converse is required to pledge allegiance, 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 allegiance to the overall obligatory nature of Jewish law. In practice, they may take upon themselves actual observance gradually. We would have expected Rabbi Sternbuch to adopt this position, but he advocates a strictly policy and demands practical commitment to observance of the commandment as a condition for official conversion. In this case, rather than drawing parallels with the repentant Jew, he connects the convert with the people of Israel at Sinai who declare unequivocally, we will do and we will listen. That's seven Jew. It would appear that the difference between the gradualness the church Sternbuch advises in regard to the repentance, as opposed to the much fuller obligation incumbent upon the convert, stems from the core halachic identity of the questionnaire as expressed through personal status laws such as marriage, divorce, and burial. Notwithstanding the similarities in their personal transformations to a completely new way of life from a formal perspective, perspective one is already a member of the Jewish collective, while the other remains an outsider. When it comes to a person who already belongs to the Jewish collective, not only must care be taken not to alienate them, but there is room for considerable legal flexibility if a more lenient ruling will facilitate the repentance process. Among converts, on the other hand, who do not belong to the Jewish collective from a formal legal perspective, <clears throat> there is no obligation to accept them. On the contrary, Rabbi Steinbuch believes that it is right the man the most stringent level of commitment from the outset in this instance, by conditioning their acceptance threshold by the Jew, to the Jewish people on their full commitment to keep all the commandments. Consistent with this approach, Sternbuch does not place any value on the Jewish blood or Jewish seed of a potential convert, such as one who has a Jewish father or grandparent. This halachic position, of course, undermines the policy of the state of Israel and challenges much of the halachic creativity that has emerged from some sectors of the religious Zionist and Eastern Sephardic rabbinates. And influence on family. This is another distinction, very important distinction. Another notable and significant difference between the returnees and the converts is the influence factor. The degree of connection and personal impact that is warranted for them to experience in relation to the people, society, and culture from which they came and engage with, engagement with them. For example, Baal Tshuva, who still lives in his family home, needs careful guidance on how to deal with a lot of questions that arise from these circumstances. How to deal with electricity on Shabbat, the lack of mezuzah, kosher laws, etc. 
but no less the cultural influences around them, exposure, exposure and engagement with the secular world, social media, and the overall disconnect from the Orthodox way of life. Rabbi Steinbuch encourages the newly observant Jew to be conscious of the various temptations and misdeeds on the part of the family members, which may entice them to return to his previous state and stick to their past. The question arises, however, if these foreign influences on the penitent are so dangerous, one would expect the authority to encourage the penitent to detach as much as, much as possible from the family and secular acquaintances. One becomes apparent rather regarding Sternbuch is that he sees one of the key roles of the penitent as a bridge figure who can serve to bring others back to repentance. According to Sternbuch's experience and understanding, often the returnees succeeds in attracting their parents, siblings, friends, and extended family towards a closer connection to religion and even adoption, a full-fledged Orthodox lifestyle. That is, with all the difficulty involved, family members are not others or dangerous sinners, but the potentially Orthodox. Therefore, the separation of the penitent from his family members would come at the, at the heavy price of the loss of additional potential believers. In light of this, Rabbi Steinbuch is very practical <clears throat> in the way he examines the professional environment of the penitent, paying close attention to the influence factor, the extent to which the penitent can impact core environment while minimizing the absorption of counter influences on the path, part of cohorts. This is for Sternbuch is the ideal situation of the penitent, as he writes in uh, source six in his words, the Baal Tshuva does not have to stay away completely from their family, which would cause them to move further away at the time when it is appropriate to draw, draw them closer. The penitent has a special duty to bring them closer and influence them towards the right spot. This is the case even if the penitent will suffer shame and insult. <coughs> Maybe the spark of Judaism will be lit among family members. All well, the suffering, belittling, and challenges experienced by the penitent at the hands of their family is a form of atonement and purification. How does the influence factor gain expression in Sternbuch's approach to converts? First, they are not required to influence the families. Furthermore, it is better that the converts stay away from family influence as much as possible, for, for they will only absorb negative influences without contributing any positive ones. Thus, regarding a female convert who wants to continue to visit the family, Rabbi Steinbuch writes in Source 7, it is preferable that she forget her past and the home of her father and cling to a Jewish family. Therefore, in this case, she is permitted to visit her father once in a while, but she must be careful, hide these visits from uh, her Jewish com compatriots. All this is for the benefit of her and the future of her family, so that they will uh, not be ridiculed. Therefore, she must hide any some connection with her biological family. The convert's family members, as opposed to the death of the penitent, are halachically non-Jewish others, without any expectation or desire that they follow suit. They all, their only rule in regard to the convert's process is that of potentially endangering the path of their relative. Consistent with his position, Steinbuch's avows in source eight, when the grandparent, grandparents are Gentiles and want to come and visit the grandchildren, and the religious children are observant of Torah and commandments, it should be explained to the Gentiles that it is better to avoid visits. For it is preferable that the children be familiar exclusively with Jewish environment in order to prevent the confusion of ex exposure to non-Jews. If the grandparents insist on, visit, in visit, on visiting, the visit should be brief. Unlike the case of the penitent, the primary impact factor regarding the family of a convert is how will it affect the convert themselves? Even if their relatives might gain interest in Judaism, it is of no consequence since they are not obligated or even desired potential members of the Jewish collective. Thus, until such a time as the relatives independently declare their intention to convert, their only role is that of potential impediments 
to the spiritual and cultural assimilation of their biological family members into alternate society. Consistent with dismissing the value of sustaining connections between converts and their non-Jewish relatives, Sternbuch strongly opposes encouraging patrilineal, patrilineal children of Jews to convert, Zera Israel. An Orthodox Jew asked how to relate to a person whose father is Jewish and whose mother is not Jewish. Does the questioner have a duty to inspire the child toward strengthening the Jewish identity? Sternbuch's answer is unequivocal. As long as the person in question lives with their non-Jewish mother, do not encourage any Jewish connections. Here, however, he points to a potentially danger regarding the impact of the son on the parents. This is source number nine. And I say that there is a strong prohibition to bringing them closer, for in this way, the gate is open to intermarriage. So it appears that there is a way to fix what has been done through bringing the child closer to world Judaism. This is a destructive approach. It will lead to permitting the most serious transgress, transgress, transgression, transgression. On the contrary, the Jewish father must understand that he is completely cut off from the Israelite nation. In this case, the formal Jewishness of the father does not justify a more embracing approach. Through his actions, according to Sternbuch, the father essentially brought himself, himself out of the Jewish collective. Thus, not only is the Jewish blood of the son of no consequence regarding his potential conversion, conversion it is actually a stumbling block since his conversions might be interpreted as a vehicle for rehabilitation of the father. To be sure, there is an additional issue, intermarriage at play. Nonetheless, the contrast with Sternbuch's encouraging approach to maintaining relationships with non-observant relatives of Jewish children is probable. For Sternbuch, the key boundary for deciding whether to adopt leniencies or stringencies is the connection of the transformative character to the Jewish collective. Fundamentally, this means that embracing the Lachic Jews justifies leniencies, while no such flexibility is justified regarding those who are not currently Jewish. Moreover, those Lachic Jews who draw close to non-Jews through marriage lose the right to be treated with such flexible gloves. Thank you, Joar. I'm going to um, try to add a piece in terms of uh, sort of some broader issues that um, that uh, uh, emerge from Rabbi Sturmbach's approach and that um, actually relate very nicely with our discussions, particularly yesterday afternoon, but in certain ways this morning as well. Um, the, the theme which uh, occurs over and over in this conference, but it's certainly very present and, and Drawer alluded to it is the theme of halakha and the other. And, and, and who is defined as the other? And there are many possibilities. So classically, of course, the other for the Jew is the non-Jew. That's the obvious one. But if we look at sources and I'm, 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 I'm being telegraphic and therefore not always, there are always exceptions, but in the Talmud, Talmud certainly introduces stratification internally within the Jewish people. And there are pre-Talmudic sources, which certainly indicate that as well, from Dead Sea Scrolls, from other places. Um, in medieval and pre-modern rabbinic literature, for the most part, the divide is Jew, non-Jew. We had these interesting discussions of apostates as and former apostates, et cetera, and, 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 and where they sit on that on that spectrum. But, you know, for the for the, 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 the the apostate and not only the apostate, even the, the term we heard yesterday, Umar al-Khalil Shabbat as the Talmud says, the public Sabbath desecrator, Talmud in, in Hulin in, in, in Yevamot re refers to the public Sabbath, Sabbath desecrator as a not as Kigoy l'chol davar, as a Gentile in every way. Now, Kigoy, not a Gentile, but the paradigm for the other is the Gentile in, 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 in that literature, in, in Maimonidian codes. Um, and um, the idea of the modern non-observant Jew, um, for the most part, you can find some sort of allusions to a type of character like that, but that type of figure who is a positive identifying Jew, but does it not through halachic observance, et cetera, but through other forms is 
uh, characteristic of the modern era. And therefore, uh, rabbinic sources have sort of spent a lot of time trying to think about, you know, what, what does this new character mean, whether it be ideological individuals, reformed Jews, et cetera, or whether it be people who adopt non-observant life or, or atheistic positions. Um, so here in the modern period, and I've written quite a bit about this, we have um, a, a, a classic divide between the so-called rejectionists and the, 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 the compromisers, the people who try to come up with different terminology, etinok shenishpa, an infant taken captive, and all sorts of variations on that, to say that the, the, the um, formal uh, uh, categories which exist in, 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 in the books, in the codes, aren't relevant to the condition of the positively uh, Zionist or um, involved or charitable or, or Jew who is just very much part of the, the collective. And there's much literature on that. Um, so here, Sternbach is interesting because in principle, Sternbach's closer to the rejectionist camp. And this is one of the big novelties of Dror's uh, master's thesis. Except if the person might become a Balchuva, if they might become a, uh, a, a, a repentant Jew or a newly observant Jew. And all of a sudden, there's this, there's this great dichotomy between two types of people who are essentially living the same kind of secular lifestyle. As soon as that person is even a little bit in, in, towards that, or and even a family member because they're related and therefore they become part of that whole, that whole frame, then they um, then they um, uh, gain a different status, and, and, and so that's where Sternbach doesn't fit easily into either rejectionist or compromiser category. Now, then we get we get to the the the, the, the convert, um, and um, you uh, as as Dror said, you might think, oh, the convert. Well, you know, if he has accepted the idea of transitional figures. Well, is the convert a total other? And here he's so adamant about the fact he's a total other, whether he has so-called no Jewish blood, whether his father's Jewish, whether he, you know, a, a, a Nuremberg law Jew, a law of return Jew, you have all these categories, you know, a, a social Jew who lived because they live in Israel, like Audrey Cohn talked about, cultural all these categories have no relevance whatsoever. And he returns to the type of binary <clears throat> that he had before so much that he rejects any of those, those uh, possibilities. So then we, I'll just end with, with a, a sort of um, a, a, a question here. So where does, where does Sturmbach stand in terms of what's the foundational element of Jewishness? So it's easy to say that it's formal halacha, but it's not like, correct. It doesn't work because all of a sudden with the potential observant, et cetera, he's all kind of not fluffy, but he kind of opens up possibilities you know, a little bit at a time and we could do all sorts of things and we have to go out of our way. And so, so where, where is he? So I'm going to suggest a distinction. I don't know if it's uh, absolutely developed, but it's certainly a, a, a springboard, I think, for discussion. So I, maybe if we, a, a good way to look at Sternbach is to compare him to the religious Zionists, uh, uh, authorities <clears throat> that have uh, addressed some of these topics. So it seems to me that for the religious Zionists, it's pretty obvious, nationalism enters the whole discussion of Jewishness and whether they're uh, trying to navigate nationalism into halachic terminology, halachic frameworks, the impetus, the, the goram, the thing that, 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 that inspires them to try to dig deep into the halachic sources is a, a, a sense of how statehood is transformative in terms of foundational elements of Jewish identity. Sternbach does not accept that, certainly politically, ideologically. But I would argue he's very much affected by living in a state environment. I don't know if the right word is ethnicity or there's a better word for it. But the fact that Sternbach sees the 
uh, Baal Tshuva as somebody who is in a separate category, of course, you could just be very interest oriented and say it's because it, the more Baal Tshuva is the more political strength or the more financial strength or the more, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Haredi block gains from those converts, those types of converts. But but if that were the case, he should say that about formal converts, too. And he doesn't. He's not interested in them. And he's not willing to introduce that kind of halakha possibility regarding formal converts. So therefore, my um, intuition is that there's a level of, I don't know, ethnicity, tribalness, some sort of sense of um, a broader collective that even this rejectionist feels um, is broader. It, it, it's more embracing of the non-observant, but not the non-Jewish other, because the non-Jewish other, number one, is politically often the enemy, or is the exilic Jew. Uh, he's not um, organically part of the Israeli world in which uh, Sturmbach operates, or maybe even the, 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 the very um, uh, um, um, nurturing Jewish community of Johannesburg in which he was exposed first to that. So that is a dichotomy that I'm introducing in light of the, the data and the initial analysis that, um, that Dror gave us. And um, I hope there'll be time for a few comments and discussions that I'm, again, very proud as a Dr. Fatter mm -hmm. to be uh, participating together with Dror in this project. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you so much. Now we have uh, about 10 minutes for questions and discussion. Yes, Chef? Um, I, I feel the need for a comparative approach because um, I would ask myself whether an ultra orthodox post poisek in, in, in Brooklyn or in um, or in uh, or in London would would uh, say anything different and it seems to me that, that this is the most um, expected uh, approach uh, from within a tra traditional slash ultra orthodox Jewish context in which you identify the schism between uh, Jewish and non-Jewish as a total schism while any other person who is Jewish is as much as possible accepted in order to become uh, observant too. It seems very expected. So do you think there's something special here because he is in the in, in Israel within a con, con, within within a Israel state that makes his approach different? Okay. I, I, have, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess. Um, um, do you want to go ahead? First, most of the answers were uh, written in uh, South Africa yeah. in the 80s. So we, uh, it's a very interesting story, his story in uh, South Africa, because he was a very uh, zealous uh, uh, rabbi in a very um, non-observant uh, Jewish community. So uh, it wasn't so easy. And one, I think that one of his... Um, uh, uh, things that he, he wanted to do was to be to um, uh, uh, try to dry to dry in uh, draw in uh, people and to uh, give them um, a way of life um, that they can uh, live with the families uh, that are non observant but they they don't have a very ultra orthodox community around them. So it's a very, very uh, complicated situation. So I, I just add that I think what's very important about, uh, about um, the, the, I, I very much agree with you in terms of the need for comparative cases. Um, I think it's very important though to recognize that the comparative point of departure is the rejectionism and the fact that he identifies with a approach which says the following. Who is the real danger to the preservation and the, um, um, the uh, success of orthodoxy? The non-Jew or the non-observant Jew? And that's the transition from the traditional other to the modern other. 
non-Jews, you know, unless they're, you know, virulent anti-Semites or unless they're college professors, they don't have a lot of impact on, uh, on, uh, on most uh, Orthodox Jews. Relatives, uh, uh, neighbors, people who go to synagogue who may be honored even though they don't live a, a lifestyle. These are the people who raise the possibility that there's another way to be a Jew. And the fact that so many of his compatriots said, therefore, we have to be very careful about our interactions with them um, is, 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 is the, the is, 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 is makes quite a bit of sense from their perspective. The fact that he's saying, no, we want to be flexible regarding the newly observant or the, the potentially observant is, is, is a real switch. Now, why does he make that switch? That's the question we didn't. So one is a kind of triumphalism is a sense we won. We're, we don't have to worry. We're not as insecure as the Khatam Sofer was, or as you know, as uh, the Chazonish was, or or whoever it was beforehand. Um, uh, the other possibility is the environmental one. That the environmental, um, um, I would say, so societal level connection with people, not only in Israel but certainly in an Israeli context. Um, there's a I'm going to use a you know a rabbinic term, but there's a um, a, a, a shutafuta goral. There's a, a, a covenant of uh, fate that um, supports a, a, a connection that is that might engine this. But it's a great question. I hope that gives them. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. As some similar question, similar angle to Moshe, but from a different direction. What you just said, what you both just said, quite correct in terms of this interesting switch, except all the contexts that you presented here are familial. In other words, I, I can imagine, but I haven't studied it carefully, that Ramosha Sternbuch, in terms of his um, uh, expressing what observer Jews, how they should, how the community of observer, of observer Jews should react to the community, to the community of secular Jews, might be a little bit more negative. He doesn't do that here because he's talking, everything is mishpacha, mishpocha, right? So within the individual convert or bal tshuva, again, they're not required, and it's a very subtle distinction, but it's a very important one. They're not required to lead that charge. They're working on their families. And his point is the newly observant should, quote unquote, work on their families. Good idea. The the uh, convert Gerish Katan Dami. You know, forget the family. I mean, he and he's really just coloring that in, and he's very consistent with that. So my request for comparative stuff would be: Do we find Rav Sternbuch on the communal level getting more into the? You know, I, I don't want to make jokes, but getting into the more expected position. Uh, the Haredim have to, or the community has to make sure that it stays away from the secular Jews because that's a communal battle. But this is, again, it's great sensitivity to individuals. That's terrific. But that also flows from this familial context, again, within halachic boundaries, right? Uh, about Chuba, he's from Jewish roots. Anyway. Uh, I, I mean, from, from the data, which is it's a great question again, and because of the comparison to conversion, it, it, it led to those examples. But for example, uh, draw us wonderful, wonderful examples of, regarding questions of um, synagogue ordinance, aliyot, um, shliach tzibur being uh, leading where Rabbi Sturmach uh, is actually willing to, uh, uh, you know, something that in many, many Haredi types of environments and poskim will say, you know, he can join the minion, but he can't leave the services. And Rabbi Sturmach is actually, um, I think it was one kid in Yom Kippur he didn't want it, but other than Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. he was fully encouraging and uh, being a rabbi, being a posek, all sorts of non-familial titles. Rabbi Sturmach also was very um, uh, supportive of um, in full integration of Bali Jews. Exactly. That again is the observant Jew in the family of the synagogue. It's still a it's still an observant context. What will he say? The observant Jews when they go out. You know, that's, in other words, in the synagogue, it's not a competition between secular Jews and observant Jews. Question is, can he represent this synagogue family? It's still more isolated. I think you have to. Be I think one of the things that, uh, you know, Dora has pointed out, which is it was in the paper very alluded to, is very important, is that 
the dissonance between de jure mm-hmm. and in social terms, we know that today in Israel, there is not something called the Haredi world, as we see through artists, through movies, through everything. The Baal Tshuva community has stayed to a great extent distinct from the Haredi world, because even if the Rav Sternbachs, et cetera, will integrate them on a halachic level, um, there's a lot of um, personal, you know, just like, you know, the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement to Me Too to, you know, not to um, Black Lives Matter today. You know, you can have lots of legal decisions, but people have their prejudices and those prejudices are sometimes are much stronger than any psika of a rabbi. Yeah. Okay, we have very little time, so Michal, last question. Um, so I just wanted to follow on this. So there is a gap between the psika and the sociology of repentance. Does it have any response in other texts to this sociology where communities of Balei Chuva actually go beyond and go right back? They escape outside of, not to mention they being like second class citizens within. And also, you compare it to conversion, but also, what, what about comparison between Baal Shela and Baal Tshuva? Does it have any like similar or resonance psika about Baal Shela, about family ties and the kind of risks entails if people are pushed away and the kind of connections? Uh, about the last uh, issue, uh, it does not uh, relate uh, at all to the Yotzim B'Shela, Yotzim B'Shela, but uh, yes. Um, maybe one play. No, no, he doesn't talk about it at all. He doesn't write about it. No, he doesn't Seven write about it. Not surprising. Okay. Mm-hmm. The reverse of right? <laughs> uh, about uh, your first questions, if uh, um, yes, uh, sorry, the first was. <laughs> The gap between the yeah. Chica and the sociology of the Baltic. So um, I think that in the, the there is a, a big gap in the ultra orthodox world from the um, uh, verbal uh, uh, welcome, the verbal welcoming, and the, the uh, verbal level of of uh, uh, treating the Chosrim Betshuva. They will put, uh, you know, an right. ads that uh, the pilot that uh, made the uh, tshuva and now is uh, very religious. But in the day-to-day life, they need to marry by, uh, within themselves. They are not uh, accepted to all the uh, education uh, uh, institutions. So it's not easy life. And I think that he is trying to make at least in a um, declaration uh, for him, that the ballet are a uh, good, we need to accept them, we need to uh, have them closed because the, sociolo- the sociology is so hard for them. And uh, we see in other places, uh, it's, it's, it's not that rare, uh, uh, rabbis that uh, wrote against the full uh, acceptance of the ballet uh, I, I would say in America, I've done some work on this, there were big debates about doing kiruv, doing outreach. And because some of the more conservative rabbis were aware of exactly what happened was once you go out, the influence isn't one directional, it's, it's bi-directional. And you see that a lot of the modernization or moderacy that you, in American Haredi world comes from the Balchuva movement, not just because of individuals, just because you have people from the Lakewood Yeshiva doing Super Bowl parties or golf tournaments in order to bring people into the community. So if a, a posek of Rabbi Sturmbach's uh, stature feels a need to reinforce the full membership of these people within the community, it would seem that in, indirectly he is trying to support the outreach approach and to embrace. Okay, we must uh, close this discussion because we don't have time. It was really interesting. Thank you. And so with a lot of things we discussed uh, in the previous session.
Um, okay, so Suzanne Stone is a professor of Jewish law and contemporary civilization and director of the Center for Jewish Law and Contemporary Civilization at Benjamin and Cardazzo School of Law, Shiva University. She is the co editor uh, in chief uh, of the NACL. Her publications include uh, In Pursuit of Contertax, uh, The Turn of the Jewish Legal Model in Contemporary American Legal Theory, Theory Harvard Law Review, Feminism and Rabbinic Conception of Justice, and Rabbinic Legal Magic. And the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, so first of all, unlike many of you, this is my absolute first foray into the into thinking about conversion. Just an anecdotal contact with it, taught a few things, read a few articles, but I've never devoted any research to it. So I want to first of all thank you so much for this amazing opportunity to learn from all of you, and um, this is particularly interesting experience for me, especially because it was so multidisciplinary. And um, here we go with a very different discipline. <laughs> so the discipline that I want to contribute to this is legal theory, which has both strengths and weaknesses, and the strength and the weakness is the same thing. Legal theorists are, you know, talking huge generalizations. It's like big picture, it's diametrically opposite to fine-grained historical study, and you will see it in action. Mm. Uh, in addition, because it is the first time that I am addressing the question of conversion, my talk is more in the lines of Michal's invitation to have fun at the beginning of this conference. I'm going to throw out a thesis and see whether it flies and we can all discuss it. So the thesis is essentially about the heightened role of new forms of sincerity that are obviously playing out in Orthodox rabbinic and especially Haredi approaches to conversion to Judaism in the modern period, but are also playing out in legal thought generally, right? Not confined to this occasion. That is, it's part of a larger issue. <laughs> it's not only conversion and it is not only Judaism, it's also changes in modernity. <laughs> Uh, and that affect the way in which people do and think about law in a lot of legal categories. And so um, that's what I want to talk about. Uh, so there have been numerous attempts to document changing ideas of the person, the self, the increased focus on inner lives that first arise in religious thought, and then their more common sense translation into new ways of formulating evidentiary rules or thinking about states of intention in law. Now, the rough story is that there's a discernible shift from focusing almost exclusively on a person's acts and declarations, right? Uh, what they said and did to assessing what they thought or felt and also feeling confident that you can know someone else's mind. Uh, I'm usually skeptical about grand theories, uh, and in the past, I've actually tried to debunk the idea of people as, you know, that there's something new about the idea of people as opaque agents with hidden motives, and that, that gave rise to modern ideas of trust, and so I claimed in a piece I wrote about uh, the rabbinic treatment of cases of the sincere yet false prophet. Still, I do think that there's something to this. It may not be large, but there's something to it, right? That there are cultural developments that help explain an increased focus in law on subjective versus objective intentions and help to explain the demise of certain formalisms in law, including especially legal performatives that usher in status changes. So sincerity and what it means to be sincere is perhaps one of the most studied ideas in an attempt to identify something new about modernity. Now, sincerity itself is as old as the hills, but the modern idea, uh, as Lionel Trilling argued, has this new emphasis. It becomes a, a central value and people can be indicted for failing to speak in accordance with their true intentions, with what they really believe. 
that presupposes that one has access to their thoughts at all times, right, and can conform the words to them. So obviously modern ideas of sincerity rest on views of the self, right, and also of language. And it's a, usually its genealogy is the usual story about the rise of Protestantism in the West. Um, and so I will try to say that modern sincerity is something that I'm going to call internal sincerity, right? Emphasizing this interiority, authenticity, rationality, avoiding symbolic thought and word magic, and subjectivity. Um, it also has another element that is often emphasized, especially by Charles Taylor, which is about ideals of self-reform and self-creation, I think that's interesting because of our prior discussion, right? And so there are, in fact, arguably, a lot of modern theology on the repentance, on repentance, right? And the Balshuva movement, uh, but here I'm thinking about Reinhold's work on Rabbi Soloveitchik is very intimately tied to these notions of self-creation, right? And self-fashioning and self-reform. Right. So, um, and I'll, one other thing is a preparatory remark because it also is. I'm going to close with some relationship with the modern state, and it's well, I think, to remember that Foucault made right, made this one key aspect that the ability to know what's inside people's minds was a special turning point. It was a major aspect, he claimed, of the new disciplinary spirit of the modern state. So, for clarity's sake. I'm going to distinguish then between the older form of sincerity, which we call formal sincerity, and this attempt to capture a new spirit of sincerity, right, which we call internal sincerity. Now, the identification of certain modern rabbinic approaches to endure <laughs> as Protestant is not my invention. Uh, it is completely, um, it's a very central point in Avi Sagi and Svi Zohar's book, Transforming Identities, in which he juxtaposes what he calls an earlier Catholic style of thought about conversion with a Protestant style of thought that he claims arose for the first time really in the 19th century discussion of Giyur. The terminology that he uses of Catholic and Protestant roughly maps onto the distinction I just outlined of external or formal sincerity and internal subjective sincerity, right? Following Tiller, Zohar and Sagi define the Catholic style as one in which, right, the religion is objective and quantifiable, requiring correct and definable performance, while the Protestant style is concerned with interiority and subjective religious belief of the individual. I like my formulation a little better because it's intended to capture the ways in which it affects legal thought and legal devices right, that are used. In any event, um, what Sagi and Zohar trace is a kind of move that the new turn to internal forms of sincerity and halakhic approaches created. It was at least a factor among many factors, of course, in the now infamous polemic over the call by Rabbi Sherman for a wholesale annulment of conversions performed by Rabbi Chaim Druckmann's Betin on the grounds that the converts were on retrospective inspection, that is long after the conversion took place, insincere about their motives for conversion or insincere about accepting the commandments. The evidence of their insincerity <coughs> was their less than scrupulous observance years after the conversion process took place. It's also manifests itself, I think, in the increasing monitoring and surveillance of converts after the conversion has taken place to ascertain whether they are indeed observant of mitzvot. And that surveillance, as we learned in the session yesterday morning, is not only communal, it's also status and bureaucratic, involving the state officials, and we spoke about this a little bit, who oversee the Marriage License Bureau. Um, this turn also transforms conversion into an impermanent and ongoing process rather than a status change. That it has no theoretical end moment, thus creating individuals who are essentially in limbo. Um, again, Sagi and Zohar trace this development and my gloss is to show how pervasive this problem is in religious and legal thought today beyond the Jewish context. Okay. 
Uh, so before resuming my largely analytic inquiry about sincerity and legal thought, I want to share two encounters I recently had, one in the classroom and one with an ethnographic study that um, influenced my thinking about this. And um, this past seminar, I taught a seminar in Jewish, this past semester, I taught a seminar in Jewish law. Quite a few of the law students were Haredi. Their education, this was in America. So we can later debate about the sociological differences or similarities. Quite a few of the law students were Haredi, their education and ongoing allegiance spanned Satmar to Lithuanian style yeshivos. They were actually extremely open and were very happy to be reading new texts and in new ways with great delight until they came to the final unit on religion and state. Right? Then it all broke down. Right? <laughs> And there I did some, you know, material on the role of religion in Israel and on Zionist halakha. And I found the remarks to be very, very interesting. The first one went on a tirade about shuttering buses on Shabbat. How horrible. What business is it of the modern state? Right? Uh, symbolic or cultural forms of public expression of identity have zero meaning. And moreover, coercing commandments is the diametrical opposite of what halakhic religion is. It's all about this internal relation to God. Then a second one on a tirade against the turn to Jewish sources to develop ideas in modern law, right? Something like the Mishpat of Free Movement. Why on earth would anybody want to turn to such, uh, these are quotes, archaic and bizarre laws? And I am <laughs> quoting exactly. Of course, these laws are the stuff of their studies over decades. But their study and performance is a matter of worship alone. Mm -hmm. right? Halakha is a faith philosophy and it should be divorced from real world concerns. Now, of course, you can dismiss this as quintessentially American. That is, it's a, you know, a thorough imbibing of separation of religion and state as practiced in the United States, including the American definition and style of religion. But it's actually, as we saw earlier, a common feature of Ashkenazi, Western, Haredi thought and practices generally, including in Israel, with, right, which is what makes Rabbi Sternbuch's uh, more delicate analysis so interesting from the perspective of our prior speakers. Something's happened. It's not exactly the same as America. Uh, when we moved on to the unit on conversion, these students identified exclusively with what Sagi and Zahor and Zohar call the Demai paradigm of Giyur, which Cattell spoke about right at the beginning of the conference. Observance of the commandments is the sole definition of Jewish nationalism. Right? Whatever community of faith may have pre-existed at Sinai was transformed and superseded by Sinai, which was an act of massive Giyur. And this view, by the way, is also in some ways a reflection of liberal versus ethnic romantic views of the role of law, right? It's a very liberal conception. Law creates the nation or the state. People become citizens through allegiance to the common law, as opposed to the idea of common and romantic nationalism, that the people who possess a language and laws give birth to the state and the state must serve the people and reflect their, right, their indigenous laws. For whatever reason, my students' comments propelled me to write on the blackboard, are we all Protestants now? <laughs> okay, the second encounter was, what I, was the reading of an ethnographic study of 21st century Protestant conversions in Indonesia. The author was interested specifically in the question of how modern ideas of sincerity, right, had transformed the conversion ceremony, its language games and its process. And two features in particular caught my attention. The first was the rejection of baptism as any kind of effective, effective act at all, because it's like magical thinking. Right? Um, and the second, which I was even more struck by actually, when the initiation of new procedures of monitoring and surveying the new converts. And this is in Protestantism, right? Right. If modern sincerity is the core, right, then there's a constant monitoring of the converts and they're perennially on probation. It's a logical outgrowth of ideas of freedom and modern sincerity because backsliding is always available without communal coercion. So I think is actually a point he borrowed from Weber. 
So the new developments within halachic conceptions of giyur, heightened focus on internal sincerity, annulment of conversions despite completion of the process, right, right, and completion of circumcision and immersion after the fact monitoring, et cetera, have their evident counterparts across religion. So now I want to go back to analytics rather than anecdotes and talk about this um, in terms of the style, styles of legal thought. Right? Um, we are enveloped in American legal philosophy in discussions about the role of sincerity. Right? It's a very large theme. Uh, not only questions of religious sincerity as a condition for asserting political rights, but also this very large debate that we're having now about whether or not there's such a thing as judicial sincerity. The obligation of judges to present reasons they sincerely hold, right, rather than justifications for their opinions. Um, and I think what a lot of these debates um, illustrate is that once you've absorbed this idea of modern sincerity, of you know, interior internal sincerity, right, it requires an inquiry into subjective intentions. And these sorts of inquiries give rise to a variety of evidentiary problems formally solved by developing some sort of objective rather than subjective test or presumptions that gave weight to declarations. So in the recent case of Hobby Lobby, an American Supreme Court case, Justice Ginsburg dissented on the grounds that sincerity is something the law simply can't evaluate. And therefore, a declaration should be sufficient. That view was roundly rejected. Right? Sincerity is merely a question of fact. The courts are expert at ferreting out the interior thoughts of their top subjects. It's no different from a credibility decision. Second um, way in which there's transformations in the thinking about how law well works is with the idea of validity. Right? So before you get this sincerity conversation, it's accepted that decisions are valid and cannot be overturned simply because there was an error in the way, and certainly not because a judge hid his true motives for ruling as she did, right? <laughs> provided the procedures for issuing judgments were otherwise met. A judicial sincerity obligation puts the whole idea of validity in doubt. Um, and if a decision is provisional and constantly subject to nullification, it raises a tremendous problem for any legal system interested in stability. And this is, of course, nowhere more evident than in the current debate about legal performatives or speech acts that affect status changes and usher in new legal regimes. Now, the law is full of that. For example, the most you know, self-evident one is I now pronounce you husband and wife. Right? Such speech acts, right, are increasingly under legal attack and legal thought because they seem on the surface to be word magic. Right? They seem on the surface now to be irrational. Uh, in the words of one U.S. Supreme Court decision, they're arid rituals of meaningless form. Hence, the current emphasis on subjected intention has penetrated even into family law in which we no longer necessarily view, right, being married as a status, and instead have started to um, look at the subjective intent to be married, <coughs> subjective intent to parent, and we've and proliferate a lot of intermediate categories between being married and being not married. And so status in general in that way has lost its force. So now I want to turn to the halachic sources and put this together. So in the context of Giyur, sincerity has two entry points. Right? It's in the legal debate over the motivation for conversion and the legal debate over acceptance of the commandments. Now, the Talmud and Yuvamud and Gerim already raises the question of motivation for con conversion. In Gerim, conversion should be for the sake of heaven, the Shem Shamayim, which is a positive requirement, a prerequisite. By contrast, in Yuvamud, the context, I think, is a, if I recall this exactly, is a giyur that took place and a question is raised as to the validity of the giyur, right? May it, might the giyur be invalid given an improper mo motive, right? Could it be disqualified? Now, what strikes me in looking back at these passages is that none, while we in English translate the whole issue as one of ulterior motive, there are no ulterior motives involved. We should rather translate it as improper motives. The motives are declared. They're out there. 
<laughs> it's not, um, there's nothing ulterior or hidden about this. They're explicit, yet improper. Paradoxically, in your Vamot, what is hidden, right, from the would-be convert, but known only to sages with special insight, is their pure motivation, right? That there's, the Satalma tells the woman who comes to convert for lustful motives, the story of Rabhia, right? But Rabhia discerns that actually within, right, is right, a motive of Shem Shamaya, the pure motive, right? Okay. So it's, I think that's actually an important layer because we don't start with a notion of investigating the interior at all. We're looking at explicit matters. Okay. In any event, the upshot of the legal discussion is that even if there's an improper motiv motivation, it may be disqualifying ab initio, but it's not disqualifying ex post facto. The conversion should not have taken place, but if it did, it is still valid. Right? Um, moreover, the Talmudic discussion seems to suggest that if the potential convert states a proper motive, the declaration should be accepted. This follows the formal mode of understanding sincerity, right? And it is connected to ideas about what we can know and language, right? So we have, right, the glosses, the midrashic glosses on verses about only God knowing individuals' inner thoughts and beliefs. Mm -hmm. And you can see this across different forms of legal discussions. It's also, right, comes in in the discussion of statements made in court under oath. Know that it is not according to what is in your heart, right? But we, but in accordance with what is in our hearts, right? The meaning the court ascribes to the speech act. Right? So um, this is a pretty... I think nearly unanimous view, which you can find even right in Rambam, who perhaps is articulating, I think for the first time, a very full blown notion of conversion <laughs> as a full adoption of the faith of faith and the faith community, right? And it comes very close to talking about sincerity in a very internal way. And yet he rules, of course, right? That if the court failed to inquire, the conversion is valid, right? So he reads the, you know, we talked about that statement about converts are as hard as scabs, right? He reads that as a legal statement, not a description. It's a legal statement. If it's a legal statement, the legal implications are that they remain within community, right? In a thorny way, they are troublesome, but they're in the community, right? Okay. Um, Let's see where I am. Give me a second. Okay. So the second entry point for modern sincerity is the requirement that a convert accept the commandments. And again, the Talmud seems to refer to a declaration of acceptance of the authority of the commandments. The model, as we talked about a little at this conference, is for this is the, the counting of the acceptance of all who stood at Sinai, right, of a new legal regime. Even though, as the Midrashists make clear, the Israelites had deceit in their hearts and were shortly going to engage in idolatry. Nonetheless, the covenant is binding. A formal declaration of agreement was uttered. So according to Zohar um, and Sagi, right, all of this stayed stable until the 19th century. Right? The new approaches first make their appearance in modernity. And they move the discussion from formal sincerity to internal sincerity, right? And the ritual acts of declaration, circumcision, and immersion become external expressions of the key event, which is subjective intent. And from this, it moves to the next stage, which is that backsliding, failure to perform the commandments become a reason to undo the conversion, because it is now evidence that in their hearts, the convert was insincere, at the crucial moment, right? And they cite Rav Shmokas is saying, it's the heart that God wants as one example. That is inner intention, a profound act of reform and self-fashioning, which links it to the case of the Baal um, And then eventually conversion ceases to be a moment of status change, but it is basically leads to, right? An indeterminate, right, state. Right? Somebody who's Gayrut is constantly provisional. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there are a lot of innovative legal techniques that get marshaled to get around the formally consensus view that conversions lacking sincerity are nonetheless ex post facto valid once the convert was accepted, uh, circumscribed and immersed. And many of them are really quite brilliant, such as a resort to the idea of confirmed presumption that certain external phenomena can indicate with sufficient precision the internal state of mind, or the argument that a pure motivation is a constitutive element of giyur and part of the performative act. And therefore the performative right becomes ineffective without it. Uh, but I think that these are indeed innovations and fascinating ones, right? That go along with this transformed idea of what sincerity is altogether. But at the same time, I want to say that the argument of, I believe it was Rabbi Bamberger, is particularly interesting about making sincerity, subjective sincerity, constitutive. Because it reveals in some ways a more sophisticated understanding of what a legal performative is all about. I think it's an unsophisticated understanding and has been, but it's been very much in the legal literature promulgated by the legal realists that these performatives retain some sort of form of magical thinking that law retains. Instead, they're not magical at all. What they really do is they work against the background of conventions. They condense a convention or series of conventions into a speech act. And they can only continue to work if the background conventions that they're condensing continue to have saliency, continue right to really be implicitly understood by everybody around. So one way the performative of circumcision and immersion work was to mark the moment when the convert entered into or joined a new religious community. Now the, divide, the demise of community effectively destroyed the background convention, right? On which the performative was resting, right? And therefore rendered it in some way meaningless. Um, I wanna add one last, Philip to this, which is uh, the modern state's role in the story. So as we learned in yesterday morning's session, the Israeli state's involvement in the conversion process has to some extent created even more stringent standards, right? Even if the motivation is to do precisely the opposite. Conversion becomes a business. It includes state-run or subsidized conversion seminaries. There's a surveillance role of the marriage registrar, et cetera. But even more striking, is the Supreme Court of Israel, which has adop adopted this internal sincerity paradigm as the measure of conversion, right? So barring no doubt from the terms in which religion is discussed in American constitutional jurisprudence, Justice Naor justifies in Rogachova the court's decision to affirm conversions undertaken in private Fateh Din by pointing out that the court can always monitor for sincerity. Right, so she says, concerns about abuse of the law, meaning the law of return, can be dealt with by increasing the oversight and supervision of a person who wishes to realize his right to status by virtue of return, such that conversion that is not sincere will not be recognized. And that is, of course, after the fact. Recognition is always after the fact. Now, how precisely the court will determine sincerity retrospectively is not spelled out. So much of the scholarly attention to the new trends in Giyur have focused not only on the debates about what really is Jewishness, joining a community of faith or one of faith, but also on the policy considerations and ideologies that underlie the discussion. This is obviously extremely important, but I do think it is equally interesting to consider cultural forces that seem to operate far beyond Judaism. <laughs> and that is what I had hoped to do today. Thank you. It was really great. Um, I opened the floor for questions. Um, All right. How did Naor say sincerity in Hebrew? Mm -hmm. How did Naor say sincerity in Hebrew? Oh, that's a very good question. I read the, trans, the opinion that my Kanut? center. Huh? Kanut, right? Kanut. Kanut. I have to admit that I read a translated opinion because. I have a body of translated opinions because my center translates Supreme Court opinions. <laughs> so, and I 
took the shortcut. It's a good question. I think. That's it's an good. excellent question. To write uh, what you said, and I, yeah. what the English was each time we. Yeah. <laughs> Even either, either way, the question of uh, you know Shakespeare says that I know this be true. So in a sense, if we've thrown objectivity out, the only thing that's left is one's personal truth, right? So that is usually banned around as a, a, a reflection of respect for the individual and their uh, their ability to you know decide their goral, their 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 um, destiny, et cetera. And here, um, counterintuitively, essentially, what you're saying is that that becomes a vehicle for limiting the individual. Yeah, I think it becomes really. That's a great point. It becomes a vehicle not just for you know for limiting their potentials, but it also becomes for great intrusiveness into the person. But I, but but within that, I was wondering, wasn't clear to me, and just because I'm I, I would, so. Is in the end of the day, do we have examples from uh, either your um, adjudication or from other legal systems where they didn't, where they, pr without producing negative motivation, they disqualified? In other words, in the end of the day, did they say, well, they weren't sincere? Or did they say, well, we know that, you know, they were sleeping together before, or we know that they didn't keep Shabbat afterwards, or they know those. Meaning that there's some objective element there? left, right? There's some objective element left that has to do with the fact that we're measuring in terms of the performance of mitzvot. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was so saying. So it's called sincerity, way, but sincerity has a litmus test, which is actually objective. It might not really be what sincerity is, is, but at the end of the day, they say, we think sincerity is- That's is, used in an evidentiary sense. It's not the measure of sincerity, right? It's rather evidence of what was the internal state at the time of the conversion. And that's a subtle difference, but a real difference, right? So you have, you're trying to get at a subjective, subjective state, but you may use various actions in order to get to the subjective state. But the subjective state is the core. Right? It's the subjective, so we, do, how do we know the subjective state, we can't just do mind reading, right? We have to use some forms of evidence, but- Isn't that, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah, no, no, no. I'm going out of my territory, mm -hmm. but from a Foucaultian sort of perspective, you're calling it the subjective state, but since no one knows the subjective state, it's just really um, um, uh, an imagined uh, way of of defining it. It's legal. That's what legal, you know, just like let's say to give from um, psychiatry of the DSM. Mm -hmm. So there's no person who's really schizophrenic. It's a term that was created in order to describe a certain types types of symptoms that seem to be very similar among a lot of people right. who have mental illness, right? So similarly here, the judges or the legislators decided that somebody who, who declares that they believe that they don't, that, that they eat, uh, you know, pork on Yom Kippur, they're not sincere. But, but, but the, 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 the thing that is, that is, that they, they, in, they invented that criterion, but they can't because you can't in the end so no, what's Kavana, what's thought, sincerity, what are all these things? But I think that, in fact, the move which allows the ex post facto invalidation is to say that you can know it, mm -hmm. right? That's the point, right? I mean, it has these concrete applications. It's, it's a, it, it is an implicit statement that obviously we still have to use evidence. How are we going to know it, right? We need some kind of evidence. Sometimes in American courts, it could be a pure credibility decision which is not based on objective acts, mm -hmm. right? It's That's really what the court was saying in Hobby Lobby. We're going to look inside you in some way and decide whether you're lying and not lying right? without any acts at all that are confirming or not confirming it. But I think the move to, to be able to invalidate something retrospectively right, assumes that there was the internal state that you needed that these later acts right, okay. suggest did not occur.
Yeah, yes. Yes, I, I wrote you you asked before. Yes, yes, yes you still I want to start up with the dancing from afar. First, thank you so much for this uh, uh, overall perspective. It's so helpful in thinking of these questions, uh, uh, looking at them through a, a, a legal theoretical co construct. Um, I, I connect more to the first part of your talk and the Protestant aspect. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis our session on Karaism earlier this morning, which of course is a kind of Jewish Protestantism in a way, because it uh, uh, tries to create new categories of thinking about tradition uh, and uh, scriptural exegesis in that sense. And it occurred to me that the idea that you that you have of the sincerity is partly what Margeno is trying to show that the Karaite sources are trying to do with the idea of the convert. Uh, and maybe it comes from the same kind of reformative idea in connection to biblical law and the interpretation of biblical law. In other words, what Margeno is showing that uh, if if a convert or apostate is sincere in the sense that he has a ta, he, he worships God in the right way, then he's just as good as any other Jew. And if a born Jew isn't sincere or doesn't have that type of um, true worship of God, whatever, however it is defined, then he's not sincere and they are both equal. So it, it seems to me that in, in the history of Judaism too, in alternative Judaisms, there were precisely these ideas uh, that you, I think, seem to say are rooted in the Protestant, in the Protestant religious outlook um, on, on conversion. And I wondered whether you have more thoughts about that, not in rabbinic Judaism, but maybe in other strands of Judaism, of course, also in reform and conservative Judaism today, these strands exist. So is this all to do with the reformative ideas concerning how we are supposed to read scripture? Do you think this is, is part of it? I think that's a hard question to answer because I think part of what I'm trying to say is that something happened that is modern. Is and modern. that is modern. And I'm I think so there is, sure. right. Yes. So I think that there's some, I'm, I'm worried about trying to then look at it, mm -hmm. right, from the lens of um, what was going on in an earlier period. Mm -hmm. right? Because uh, obviously, and I think obviously the Rambam is a good example of somebody who yes. also says, right, yes. very, very clearly, right, that. You know, the basis for conversion is what we would call in general sincerity. But he yes. also at the same time is holding to legal forms, right, that are part of the worldview, I would say, of formal sincerity. Mm -hmm. right? Even though, I'm, you know, you know, it's not that sincerity itself is a new concept. That's sincerity so is not. right. Yes. It's this other thing. It's the way that thinking that you can know what's inside somebody's thoughts, that you need that, that that's constitutive, that that's part of it, right? And that our aim is to get at that. That's what I think is new. So I think this is partly a medieval development, the individualization of the, ind the, the idea that the individual in the 10th, 11th, 12th century is becoming a much more important central right. key in understanding religious motivation, right. in understanding these questions. I think it is very pre-modern. You mentioned quite rightly the Rambam, and he has Karaite predecessors. He's quite aware right. of the Muatazelite worldview of the question of, of universal uh, um, ideas of, of, uh, of, of working God and what right. it means to be righteous. So I think it is connected to the idea of the individual becoming a, a very important uh, uh, way of looking at conversion. And that is post 
uh, ancient it is. It's a very medieval kind of... I mean, of in Western thought, we tend like to think of it as 12th medieval. century, yes, only right? Yes. Bernard of Cleves. And yes. um, we do think about it that way, whether that genealogy is exactly correct. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know. Although I will say that I've always... I mean, obviously, there's huge questions of the individual that characterize late antiquity. I mean, that's one of the major themes of late antiquity, the, the birth of the individual. Yes, but, but I think like it might be the following. We don't have time. We don't have time. Um, uh, the following uh, distinction that I think it might be interesting, and I don't know enough to know whether it's right, which has to do with the depth that elites have versus, you know, just people. Right? People don't necessarily have such refined interior lives. But rabbis do, and you know, elites have, and that was a, for a long time. That was the kind of assumption that went on, and laws generally. We must uh, close this session. <laughs> so, so session now. It was great. So thank you. Yeah, we had originally imagined that we could have a kind of final general discussion, <laughs> but we have run out of time. <laughs> so. But for good reasons, because we had very, very lively and interesting discussions uh, following the excellent lectures that we heard this morning. So I'm not sad about it, but it's just, so congratulations to everybody. Thank you for your lectures. Thank you for the discussions. And now we have a last so, lunch. Everyone, exactly how you organize them.